Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. And this one we'll be talking about Linus Torvalds' views on ECC memory. We're going over Noctua's roadmap for 2021 and some other semi-CES updates from companies. Uh, AMD suggesting that it might be looking into FPGAs via its uh, patent, or integrated FPGAs rather. And then a couple of other things like GPUs getting affected by tariffs. Intel's 300 series chipsets entering EOL, and Z590 motherboards starting to show up. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's Core P3 case. The Core P3 is one of the most unique cases on the market. It can serve as an open air standing chassis, a test bench in vertical or horizontal orientation, or as a wall mounted showcase PC. The Core P3 now comes with a five millimeter thick tempered glass panel for its side, but keeps the front, top, and back open for air. You can learn more at the link in the description below. Couple really quick GN items first. First of all, if you didn't see this video, check it out. It's on the channel already. This is the backwards motherboard. So it's got the CPU socket on the back side. The rest of it's on the normal side. Really interesting. It does have an actual functional reason to be like this. And we talk about that in the video. But check it out if you didn't see it. Super interesting and unique design. And the reason it's so unique is because there's a massive passive cooler, we'll show some footage of it, that accompanies this. And then we also strapped an Octo fan on it because why not? We put a 200 millimeter fan on it. But anyway, check that video out. Uh, the disappointment shirts, we are going to be closing the, the back orders for the last run of these disappointment 2020 shirts. Like always, we will have one that's got just a, like a different back to it without the 2020 disappointment tour dates. So you will be able to get one of those. But if you want to grab one of these specifically that relates to the video that we posted, then this is your last chance at this point because we want to close these orders, get the final print run in, and then uh, then that'll be it for the design. Just because it's you know it says 2020 on it and it was related to a specific year and time. So this is the last run. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you want to pick these up. They've been insanely popular. Thank you to everyone who has ordered them. Uh, for those of you who ordered when they weren't on back order, you should have likely gotten a shipping notice by now. Uh, and of course, you can always email support at gamersnexus.net. And for those of you who back ordered, they'll be going out in the next couple of weeks, probably in about three to four weeks or so, uh, late January or first week of February, once we get the next order in. And one final quick update, the mouse mats are now back in stock. The wireframe mouse mats, we have a huge quantity of them. We've actually had huge quantities of them, but they have typically sold out. First one was within, it was under 48 hours, I think. Second one lasted a little longer, maybe a week or something like that, a couple days. Uh, this one should last a while. So if you want one of the wireframe mouse mats, they're in stock and shipping now. If you back ordered one, then those shipments have already gone out or are going out in the next couple days. So thank you for your patience on that. Uh, that one took us a while. There were That was a really storied delivery, <laughs> but they are here and they're shipping. So uh, you can pick one up on the store. Okay, let's start with Linus Torvalds and his rant on real world tech about Intel and its impact on ECC memory. So Linus Torvalds is easily one of the top three Linuses of history. There's the Linus we all know, there's Linus Torvalds, and then there's Linus as in the friend of Charlie Brown. Linus Torvalds though uh, always has commentary on Linux. He's uh, the inventor of Linux and, and at this point the sort of guardian of the kernel. Uh, Torvalds went on a rant over on Real World Technology, which is run by a friend of the site, David Cantor, if you didn't know. And he discussed the possibility of more Ryzen 9 5000 SKUs in the future. As these forum discussions are wont to do, it quickly moved into AMD versus Intel territory, and eventually to the validity of ECC memory for consumer-oriented SKUs. While Torvalds was rather chatty throughout the thread, it wasn't until the topic of ECC memory that he became especially vocal. In response to one user disagreeing with him that ECC memory mattered for consumers, Torvalds unleashed the following, quote, ECC absolutely matters. ECC availability matters a lot, exactly because Intel has been instrumental in killing the whole ECC industry with its horribly bad market segmentation. Go out and search for ECC dims. It's really hard to find. Yes, probably entirely thanks to AMD, it may have gotten slightly better. But that's exactly my point. Intel has been detrimental to the whole industry and to users because of their bad and misguided policies with regard to ECC. Seriously. And if you don't believe me, then just look at multiple generations of Rowhammer, where each time Intel and memory manufacturers bleated about how it's going to be fixed next time. Narrator, no. It wasn't. Now, unsurprisingly, if we keep scrolling, Torvald's commentary gets a little more colorful at this point. 
As is probably obvious, Torvalds is referring to Intel's years-long policy of pushing ECC memory in the server and enterprise segment, and really nothing else outside of that. Intel killed off ECC memory support for its consumer chipsets and CPUs years ago, but AMD supports it in an unofficial capacity with Ryzen. However, Anantac's Ian Kutris chimed in and pointed out that while unofficial support is a step in the right direction, it shouldn't be taken at face value as a working feature. Kutris said, quote, to the extent that even though you can have a consumer CPU and ECC memory installed, and the motherboard reports that ECC is enabled, actually ECC might not be enabled. Even software that states that ECC is enabled is simply reading the motherboard register. The only way to confirm it is actually there is to do a test that forces an ECC correction and to monitor them. This means that a chunk of people who actually think they have ECC working on a system do not. Finding the right combination of motherboard, motherboard BIOS and firmware, and memory to work is somewhat confusing because people are reporting that ECC is enabled when it's simply only being reported as such by the motherboard and not actually tested. Surely no one would ever say that their system is doing something that it actually isn't. We've never heard of that before. Uh, really common, of course, in the DIY community where people think they have a feature working when it's actually not. Uh, you can look at undervolting and Ryzen years ago as a great example of that, where there was a brief period where a bunch of people thought they had Ryzen running at one volt, as in 1.0, and in actuality it was stable, but the performance was getting cut in half. So uh, very common. But ECC support for client and desktops may matter to a different degree once DDR5 arrives. Uh, DDR5 will bring on-die ECC capabilities for addressing single-bit errors and uh, that's a little ways out, obviously, but that is on the roadmap. Okay, up next, this, we're going to keep this really brief because it's about cryptocurrency prices, and we haven't really run stories about cryptocurrency prices since probably the summer of 2017. And uh, generally, would rather not. It's not really, not really tech news as such, but uh, it sort of is. In this way, the GPU availability may be further hindered by the fact that uh, cryptocurrency prices, they're chaotic as always. I'm not even going to give a number because it's going to change by the time this publishes. But they're all over the place, uh, especially on the high side right now and for the last couple months or so. And because of that, there's an increase in interest for mining, either by gamers who are seeking to uh, pay off GPUs in an extremely slow fashion, or by mining operations. Certainly, we've uh, all seen photos and videos at this point of mining operations, if, if not a few years ago, then more recently. So with the upward trend, uh, it was a couple days ago at 40,000. I think it dropped. Don't know what it is currently. Again, not going to bother saying it because it'll change by the time this publishes. Uh, Ethereum also moved up. And these are what preceded the abysmal 2018 GPU market. Ryan Smith from Anantech actually points this out as well. And uh, 2021 is already dealing with things like bots who are scalping uh, or bots aiding scalpers and limited supply to meet demand and now mining which will exacerbate the second point. So something to keep in mind, you're going to be contending with that. But let's move on, because that's there's not really anything we can do about that. AMD patent suggests integrated FPGAs. An AMD patent was recently unearthed by the internet, and it suggests that integrated FPGAs may be what AMD had in mind during its Xilinx acquisition that we covered previously. Uh, the patent outlines 20 claims. It has the usual drawings accompanying them, and uh, showing the implementation of executing specialized instructions with those FPGAs with processors and programmable logic units. The patent seems to hint that AMD is looking to develop a hybrid CPU FPGA implementation. FPGAs are somewhat niche ICs that are efficient at accelerating certain workloads requiring special instructions and can be reprogrammed for other instructions similar in nature to ASICs. The idea of using FPGAs to accelerate data center performance in servers has often been thrown around, and Intel spent a fortune to buy FPGA maker Altera back in 2015, and to date, not much in the way of actual products has come of it. To Intel's credit, it did eventually bring the uh, 6138P to market, which is a, a Skylake SP SKU of CPU. It's a Xeon CPU. It has on-package Area 10 GX1150. The Area 10 FPGA is one of the three UPI channels to give it access to the CPU. While it's technically integrated in that the CPU and FPGA share the same package and substrate, what AMD seems to have in mind is different. So exactly how AMD plans to carve FPGAs into its CPUs is still a little bit of a mystery, despite the patent document giving us some ideas. Uh, AMD has been pioneering chiplet design since Ryzen's inception in 2017 
NVIDIA does have it had a white paper out years and years ago on MCM or multi-chip module approaches for GPUs, which as a side note here, and the also recently published white paper or at least uh, patent documentation on via USPTO, um, although its approach is different from NVIDIA's, but it's also looking at chiplet design for GPUs. Anyway, AMD pioneered chiplet design for Ryzen's inceptions. The patent here explains that the CPU and the FPGA would share registers with the floating point and the integer execution units. And this implies that AMD would be designing something that, in the very least, would share the same dot. So that's not too surprising based on what AMD has been doing. AMD could also be looking to develop CPU cores with FPGA capabilities. This one goes back to 2018 again. So in 2018, we talked about how tariffs were set to impact the PC industry. Uh, this was US government tariffs, so it does affect the US. It had a knock-on effect to Canada because a lot of the stuff arrives to port in the US and then gets trucked up, so it still gets hit by tariffs. But this story is back. As a reminder for what it was back then, there were some interesting components to it, interesting as in, uh, not really <laughs> weird, strange, where you'd have a discrete keyboard or mouse being affected by tariffs, but the combination of the two not affected by tariffs, or a completely assembled PC affected in a different way than a partially assembled PC, and a certain components were, were uh, completely immune to ta the tariffs, so like memory stands out. If, if my memory serves correctly, memory was one of them that was not affected, uh, but then power supplies certainly were, video cards certainly were, and cases actually were in a big way. Now, these companies could have, and some likely did, applied for uh, exemptions. So you can get a US government tariff exemption, but they are not always granted. They do require certain conditions to be met. Normally, when you're applying for an exemption, the primary uh, point that you have to make to the government is that you cannot produce the product in the US. Now, that is definitely true for a lot of these, as in right now, today, you cannot produce these products in the US, most of them, like video cards, for example. You might be able to do bits and pieces like assembly, but to buy all the components, the whole supply chain is elsewhere. So that was the story in 2018. Now back then, the component price hikes were going to be between 10% and 25%, depending on the category of the component. Now many of these tariffs did end up getting exemptions that carried into 2020, and so you haven't seen the massive price increases in, in some categories where you might have in others, like cases still got affected for a lot of people, for a lot of manufacturers. So uh, December 31st, 2020 marked the end of a lot of the government level exemptions and the individual level exemptions where manufacturers applied for said exemption also have an expiration date that have most likely expired at this point. And as we enter 2021, uh, with the expiration of these exemptions. And while the country is uh, sorting itself out, it's unlikely that this issue will be high on the priority list to get immediate attention. So we wouldn't expect to see exemptions extended in like post haste immediately. Uh, they might be, but not right now. So some of the manufacturers, one of them did reach out to us anonymously. Another one has commented to, I believe it was Tom's Hardware, and between the two of them, we've gotten basically the same information. So ASUS issued the following statement. They said, update regarding MSRP pricing for ASUS components in 2021. This was a public statement. The update applies to graphics cards and motherboards, ASUS said. They said, we have an announcement in regards to MSRP price changes that are effective in early 2021 for our award-winning series of graphics cards and motherboards. Our new MSRP reflects increases in cost for components operating costs and logistical activities, plus a continuation of import tariffs. We worked closely with our supply and logistics partners to minimize price increases. ASUS greatly appreciates your continued business and support as we navigate through this time of unprecedented market change. And they also had a footnote here, additional models may see an increase as we move further into quarter one. You've possibly already seen some impact if you've looked around on discussion forums online or at retailers, but uh, some of these components that Video cards, motherboards, power supplies are most affected. Those are the most likely to see an increase because they have the least margin. So they are all impacted by tariffs, but the degree to which you, the consumer, will have that impact passed on to you is largely contingent upon the competition of the specific market segment and the average margin for the companies competing in that segment. So if their average margin in, say, video cards is somewhere in the range of four to eight percent, where the, the total margin range is typically like 1.7 percent at the extreme low end, 
from one of the cards that uh, we covered years ago up to about 10% for flagship level cards. Split the difference somewhere in there is your margin. It's not really enough room to keep making a profit while also paying more on import for the device when they bring it in. So you're probably going to see the cost extended to you, almost certainly. Some companies might decide to go the loss leader route and undercut others just to gain market share at the expense of literal expenses. But uh, that's, that's just a strategic move. According to New York Times, imported goods from China will now see a 7.5% to 25% tariff, uh, depending on the good in question. We expect the first half of the year will still be bad for GPUs, and that's not to mention the impacts on supply chains in general with the pandemic plus now GPU mining being where it is. So now on to some neutral news, or maybe good news, depending on how you feel about Noctua. Uh, this one will be nice because it it's, breaks up the bad news that we don't really want to cover because there's enough of that in the world already. Noctua's roadmap for 2021 was released. The company, in a sense, is charming because Noctua is probably the only company in the PC industry that can put white fans and black fans on its roadmap for 2021 and excite people. Not even the specs of the fans, just we're gonna make fans that aren't this color, the one on the table. Are you, ha are you not entertained? This is Noctua. This is why people uh, respect Noctua, I think. So Noctua did release its official 2021 roadmap. It, it has a few things, so it's got, uh, it's getting feisty in the second quarter of 2021. It'll be releasing a black version of the NF A12 by 25 fan. The A120 fans were knocked to his big deal release probably about two years ago now. I think it was at Computex. Uh, following this up, Noctua will have an even riskier white fan alternative, and that'll be in quarter three. So for any other company, this would be a footnote in the slide deck, if even that. They might not even tell the press about it. But Knox was excited too. Noctua's first quarter launch will feature a CPU air cooler in the Redux line. Uh, it's got Redux fans as well, if you're not aware of those. It will have a passive cooler coming out later. So the passive cooler did slip, but that one is one we covered at Computex 2019. And uh, it looks like it's finally coming to market for second quarter of 21, if you were interested in that. Other small launches include heatsink covers and a black version of the NHU-12A. Uh, Noctua is also working on an eight-way fan hub, and it's got a voltage converter coming out on the roadmap, and it also has its uh, next generation NHD15. We think this is probably also the one that we covered at Computex pre previously. It's probably changed a bit, but Noctua tends to, sh to show stuff way in advance at trade shows, uh, which is cool because it shows prototypes and you get to see early designs and ha potentially have feedback uh, that Noctua will actually read on them. So that's all on the plans for 2021. Intel's 300 series is entering EOL. So just a very quick update on this. Intel recently disclosed a pair of PCNs or product change notifications, including the 300 series. So Z390, Z370, uh, H370, Q370, B365, B360, and H360, sorry, H310. Um, these chipsets were built into motherboards for Coffee Lake and Coffee Lake refresh SKUs, and they will be getting retired in the immediate future. They are paired with 8th gen and 9th gen CPUs. Intel will continue offering the 400 series for the foreseeable future, which introduced the 1200 socket and support for 10th gen. And there's of course the 500 series chipset coming out CES 2021, so this week. Uh, this will support the looming 14 nanometer Rocket Lake, as well as the current Comet Lake based CPUs. More on that in a second. Discontinuance for the 300 series began on January 4th of 21, and the final shipments are scheduled for January 28th, 2022. So if you're a retailer and you want to get some in, you've got some time. Uh, Z590. So we've been hearing for months now that Intel Z590 chipset, for whatever reason, would arrive well before the launch of the Rocket Lake S CPUs. That would be the 11th gen or 11,000 series coming out, which uh, also has news this week. But the Manufacturers, motherboard manufacturers have the option to launch or announce boards at CES, digital CES, this week or next, or any time before the launch of Rocket Lake S. If they feel they can meet the, the production requirements to actually put them to market, they'll probably announce it. And the actual CPUs, from what rumors are saying, will be in a couple months, so maybe by March or around March. Uh, sometime in the first quarter is what Intel is saying at this point. So we can't really imagine what reason you would buy Z590 now, because 
you could put a 10th series CPU in it, but that just seems, it just seems like an odd decision to buy a Z590 and then 10th, series, 10th gen, we'll call it, um, when it's clearly targeted at, at 11th gen that's coming out in a couple of months and will actually be better from what it sounds like now. So the only reason it maybe makes sense is if you already have 10 series, you are dead set on buying 11th before there are any reviews, uh, then maybe it makes sense in a strange way. But otherwise it's kind of an odd, normally they come out roughly around the same time and this time the motherboards are way in advance of the CPUs. Although you won't see them all in out, some of the partners will definitely wait until the CPUs so that they can maximize their impact. Anyway, that's the news on Z590. Uh, Jim Keller joins an AI startup in the next story. So last year, Jim Keller abruptly left Intel after a relatively short two-year stint. At the time, Keller cited personal reasons for his departure and agreed to assist Intel for six months as a consultant while the company transitioned to new leadership for its silicon engineering group. As of January 6th, Keller is now with the AI startup TensTorrent, where he is serving as president, CTO, and board member. According to the company, Keller will lead TensTorrent's efforts to be the hardware solution needed to address software 2.0, uh, the exciting industry shift, they say, towards using machine learning methods to solve problems previously addressed by traditional software. Keller himself added that, quote, software 2.0 is the largest opportunity for computing innovation in a long time. Victory requires a comprehensive rethinking of compute and low-level software. TensTorrent has made impressive progress, and with the most promising architecture out there, we are poised to become a next-gen computing giant. So the company focuses on chips for AI and machine learning and currently offers a, its Grayskull AI processor. The Grayskull chip offers 120 of the custom 10.6 cores, five RISC cores, a reprogrammable SIMD processor, 120 megabytes of uh, on-chip SRAM, and eight channels of LPDDR4 DRAM. Up next, AMD's uh, AGISA 1.1.90 microcode update. So uh, AGISA, as a reminder, is the binary pack that AMD distributes to motherboard makers. They then integrate it into the motherboards for BIOS. Uh, so it's a binary and it comprises the backbone of BIOS, including the, AMD, the entire AMD overclocking section. So an update is coming out for that. The new AGISA code will come down from motherboard vendors in the form of BIOS and UEFI patches uh, starting in January and hopefully being done by February from what it sounds like. Key features include mostly better uh, sleep state or power state support. So Active Idle will be better supported. What Microsoft is calling modern standby will be supported. So the, the code for this one is S0i3. Uh, so sleep states are like S3, S4, S4 being hibernate, S3 being sleep. Uh, then you have active, you have active idle, you have off, and now there's stuff like S0 i3, which is modern standby. It's all defined by Microsoft for, uh, for Windows. So this is being added to the Ryzen line. AMD is also adding support for passively cooled X570 motherboards, for the chipsets that is. Uh, AMD did not disclose any details about passively cooled X570 boards. The only such motherboards we're aware of are the Gigabyte Extreme and the Asus Crosshair uh, Dark Hero, both of which don't use a chipset fan, but a lot of the X570 boards don't spin their chipset fan unless it's under a lot of load anyway, so they're kind of semi-passive to begin with. Elsewhere, AMD is also claiming improved stability with 1800 to 2000 megahertz infinity fabric for the clocks, as well as, quote, general stability improvements. So 1800 to 2000 would be a big deal if 2000 can be hit more regularly. At launch with the original series of AGISAs, we were unable to ever hit 2000 megahertz. The max we were doing was 1900, maybe 1933. And because you want to maintain a one to one to one with U clock, F clock, and M clock, uh, this is actually significant and it does limit the, the maximum memory frequency you really want to push on these platforms. So that would be a big deal if it starts to, to work. Last up, NZXE's H1 case goes back on sale after functionally a recall or at least a cessation of sales. We do have one here. We were working on trying to replicate the, the fire issue that NZXT had and might follow up with a video on that. We're trying to get one of the, um, the replacement kits that they shipped out to people first though. So in one of the more embarrassing hardware failures of 2020, NZXT got to recall its H1 cases due to a what it called a safety hazard originally. This later turned out to be a fire hazard. It was entirely related to screws and the riser card, the riser PCB, PCIe riser PCB, where uh, metal to trace contact or some other short, direct short, was causing a fire. So this 
NZXT at the time said had happened on fewer than 10 of its cases. We're not sure to what degree that may have changed, but that was the original news. It, it was supposed to be a pretty low run issue. And they were allowing anyone to apply for the screw pack to replace the metal screws with, we're assuming, nylon ones, but we were unable to get the pack thus far. Uh, and that should be the fix. So NGXC issued basically a recall. It paused sales for the H1. It began shipping out H1 repair kits. Those do include two new screws for the riser card assembly. Anybody can do it. And now NGXC has revisited the H1 and stated that H1 sales will resume at this point. They said, quote, the H1 has been updated to address the safety issue and is once again available for sale. Thank you for your patience and understanding while we resolved this matter. And that would also include their pre built that use the H1. So uh, that's it for hardware news for this one. As always, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to support it directly. This is the last chance at this point to buy these disappointment shirts for 2020. And we're going to close sales uh, within the next couple of days, depending on quantity. And then uh, you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess. But barring those, definitely check this backwards motherboard video out because it was a lot of fun and we really liked working on it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.